part of James's prayer said that our hope is in the truth of God's word. And that's exactly right. And so I want you to take your copy of God's word and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And we're actually going to see and hear God speak to David today. Uh, last week, we tackled five chapters in the book of 2 Samuel. It was stories of murder and betrayal. There was someone who was struck dead by touching the Ark of the Covenant. And so there was a lot of things that would capture your attention last week, even if it's in a weird, sick, twisted way. Those storylines tend to keep us active in our attention span. Today, we tackle one chapter, and we're going to read the whole thing, but we're going to study just the first half. And I would hope that it captures your attention even more than last week, because we're going to hear God speak. So we're in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we're going to read sections today. Um, Frequently, I ask you to stand while we read, but I know some of these passages can get lengthy, and so you don't need to stand as we read. But the introduction for today comes from the first three verses of chapter 7, and so we're going to read those to start. It says this, Now when the king lived in his house, the king being David, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So as our introduction, we see a shift in the story. Uh, Some time has passed, clearly, because last week we saw that David had just defeated the Philistines. He took the ark and moved the ark into Jerusalem. And so now he's in a temple or a dwelling of some sort, like a palace. So we know that time has passed because David is in a palace now. He is settled in Jerusalem. We saw in verse 1 that he had rest and he had freedom from his surrounding enemies. And he was actually sitting on the rooftop with this new guy, Nathan, and he was looking for something to do. An honorable place to be, looking around and saying, I've got some time on my hands, what should I do? And so part of the introduction is also a new person we're introduced to, Nathan. Nathan is a prophet of God. His responsibility is to deliver the word of God. Just that deliver the word of God. So David presents to him an idea, okay? We don't see the specific idea. We, we see the implication of the idea. David says, I'm living in a palace. God is dwelling in a tent. And Nathan says, I know where you're going. You want to build something for God. And so Nathan replies and says, go do what's in your heart. Okay? So there's our introduction. This is a great idea to build a house for God. Here's two godly men having a relaxing afternoon, and they're talking about something that is honoring God. Our intention, David's intention, was to say, this is a great idea to bring honor and glory to God. But as nice of a scene as it is, as great of intentions as it is, we have to see what's next. Because as we discovered last week, God is the one that we're supposed to follow. We can't follow him unless we know where and how he is leading, unless we consult with him. So while David had great intentions filled with gratitude for God, it doesn't mean that his idea was supposed to happen or maybe the timing wasn't right. And so we need to see that God is revealing to David a plan. And that plan comes about starting in verse 4. So I want to read to you verses 4 through 11. It says this, But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, Did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? 
Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appoint judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies." So here we see this introduction, time has passed, David is relaxing, he has honorable intentions, and God immediately stops this. But did you notice the tone? Here's one of those little things I like to call a free lesson, okay? Here's David ready to do something, and God has to stop him by going to Nathan to declare this truth to David, and basically God says, stop, don't do what you think you want to do. But I want you to hear God's tone. Did you sense the tone in there? That God shot down David's idea, but it wasn't a rude way. It was a loving way. It was a gracious way. Here is God Almighty and someone who says, I'm going to do something for God, but God never told him to do it. And God stops him with love and with grace. And I, I read this and I said, how do I treat people that do something unexpected towards me? or that do something that I know isn't right, or maybe I look at it and I go, that's illogical, that doesn't have common sense. A lot of times that generates in me this irritability. Do you sense God irritated with David? No. Do you sense that God is shouting and yelling at David because David was about to take a step that wasn't part of God's plan? No. With grace and with love, he goes to David and simply reminds him of a lot of important things lessons. So think about your own tone. When someone does the opposite of what you want them to, it's unexpected, it's illogical, maybe if it's even painful, how do you respond? Is it responding with grace or with anger? With impatience or patience? With love or resentment? And so that's a free lesson, but now let's zoom in on what God says. God is giving David lessons about himself. God himself is giving lessons about himself directly to David through Nathan. Remember, Nathan is declaring the word of God. And so what did we see in here? From that particular reading, we saw that God and his word is the authority. God is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He alone has and is the authority over all. And you notice in verse 4, how long did it take God to respond in his authority to correcting David's idea? Verse 4, that same night. David and Nathan had their conversation. They went their separate ways, and God intervenes right into the life of Nathan, and he says, wait. So that same night, God's timing is perfect. He isn't delayed. He doesn't lose control of his plan. God, in his authority, knows what is to be accomplished, and it will be accomplished perfectly. And so that same night, he talks to Nathan. David, in his excitement, was probably thinking, this is a great idea. Is there anyone here that loves to dream big about things and immediately get started on those things because they're exciting? Those are fun times, and David is like, I'm going to build this house for the Lord. This is so great. He might have been sketching plans. He might have been calling architects. He might have gotten his shovel and was ready to break ground already. We don't know. But we know none of that happened yet because that same night, God intervened. God had something to say, and he did. He told Nathan to tell David, look at verse 5, thus says the Lord. What a confident authoritative statement. And it's because God has the authority. He's the only one that can make that type of statement and it means something and it sticks. Thus says the Lord. Nathan is to go to David and simply tell him what God says. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't move in front of it. Don't try to rush it. Let God's word be God's word. And this is tough for us because we insert ourselves into God's word and then we try to figure out how we can make it all about us. And God is telling Nathan as a reminder, you told David to move forward with this plan. 
I am reminding you, Nathan, and through Nathan, I'm also going to remind David that thus says the Lord, I have the authority. I am the one who speaks. And so let my word be my word, God is saying. We ask ourselves, is what I'm about to do in line with God's will? How do we know? What are we supposed to do to answer that question? We want, maybe our hearts say, we want the direction of God in our next step and in our plans and in all of our decisions, but it's so easy to get caught up in our own mind. And then half the time when I am thinking clearly and I say, I want God's guidance, I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to hear from him. This isn't what's happening with David or Nathan, but in our own lives, we have to say, do we know what God is saying? And how do we know what God is saying? We have his word. But you have to understand this was written thousands of years ago. How does this navigate my current day life? Well, we also have his presence. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're filled with the presence of God. And you can go to him whenever you want to seek guidance and comfort. And he will direct your plans. Remember, go back to the tone of God with David. God is telling him, I will tell you what to do. I will guide you and I will lead you. But yet here we are so many times thinking that if we go to God and we ask him for guidance, he's going to be mad. He will do the very thing he's promised and he will say, yes, children, I will tell you what to do because I have the authority. We have to remember that God's word has the authority, not man's great ideas or intentions. And so we look again, not only to verse 5 where it says, thus says the Lord, but then he repeats it again in verse 8. He tells Nathan, you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts. Why is it repeated? So often we see repetition in scripture. It means it's meaningful and powerful, and we better get it through our brains what it means. It also shows us that mankind loves to operate under our own understanding. We love to go forward with our own plans because we say, but my intentions were pure. Yeah, but was it God leading you to that idea, to that next step? And we see here, while David was a man of honor, he was trying to do something for the Lord that was a great idea, but God said, no, it's not time. And so he says to David or to Nathan, Here's what you need to tell David. The Lord says this. So by whose word, by whose authority does anything happen? God. God is the one that all things happen. Things make sense because of God. He is the one that has all of the authority. And so David and Nathan are getting a reminder. Seek God first. Submit to him in all things. Even if you think your intentions are honorable to God, go to him and ask him, what is my next step? How can I best move forward with this bubbling up of excitement that David had, that I want to show God that I love you and I want to honor you and bring glory to your name? And so David jumps ahead and says, I'm going to build something. And God says, slow down. It's not my timing. So we have to understand that it is God's authority. David gets a reminder Nathan gets a reminder. Here's a reminder for you from other places in Scripture. Psalm 119 tells us, Your word is settled in heaven. The sum of your word is truth. Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. John 17, 17, Your word is truth. And we're going to see David say in verse 28 of chapter 7, Your words are true. God and everything he says is true. God and everything about him is truth. And he has the authority over everything you can imagine and see. It's all by his permission. And David and Nathan just needed a nudge to remember that. Relaxing afternoon, dreaming up ideas, good intentions, but God is saying, let's harness that energy into something else. Recognize first that I'm in charge. It's a great reminder for us. There are so many battles in our current life for who's in charge. Whether you have children, whether you are an employer or employee, we all have this urge to be in charge, and God is telling these two godly men who have power, I, God, am in charge. God doesn't stop with his lessons there, though. Because while he tells us and reminds us that he has the authority, 
he reminds us of this great truth that speaks to the very depth of who we are. And he shows Nathan and David that he is present. While they were having that rooftop conversation, God was there. He knew what they were talking about. While they were about to take the next step, he was there. He interrupted because he had something to say, because he's present, and he knows exactly what that next step of David would have been without intervention. He was there for the conversation. He was there through all of this. God is here right now to speak to your very heart in this place and maybe either encourage you in the truth and the reminder that Jesus Christ is your Savior, or maybe he is urging your heart right this very moment to say Jesus Christ needs to be your Savior. But he is right here in this place. God is present. And so we saw David's idea That God, I now have this palace that I'm living in and I look across from my rooftop view and I see that all you have, God, is a tent. But God is saying that through the traveling of the ark, through the setting up of the tabernacle and the tent, that he, God, was among mankind. He was with them on their travels. And we see that God is reminding them over and over again that he is with them. He is not distant from them. He is not outside of them. He is among them. This is such a critical truth to remember. Because God in his authority is not bound by human restrictions, but he demonstrates something that we all need. Relationship. The God of the universe is a relational God who cares He doesn't allow you to run away from his presence. He is all-knowing and all-authority, and he knows what he's doing. And at the moment that you cry out to him, he is there for you. We actually see that this is a deep theological passage that's revealing and reminding us of the truths of God. Richard Phillips says this about the tabernacle. The tabernacle revealed a glory so marvelous for weak and afflicted sinners. The glory of a God who graciously condescends to go down with them in order to save them. Do you recognize that God in all of his authority says, I'm going to send my son Jesus humbly in the form of a servant all the way to death on a cross so that you, a sinner, deserving of nothing, can be saved. God is with us and he is present. Dale Ralph Davis says this, he is the God who travels with his people in all their topsy-turvy here and there journeys and wanderings. Do his people live in tents? So does he. Are they a pilgrim people on their way to the land of promise? So he is the pilgrim God sharing the rigors of the journey with them. God is with you. He is present, and we see in verse 7 of chapter 7, and in verse 9 of chapter 7, God says this, I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling, in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel. I have been with you wherever you went. Is there more of a refreshing statement than what God just said? I am with you wherever you go. So is there such a thing as loneliness when you're a follower of Jesus Christ? No, because God is always with you, meaning you are never alone. Do we have to battle the feelings of loneliness from a human relationship interaction? Of course we do. But is there someone who we can cry out to all the time, reminding us we are never alone, and he comforts us, and he guides us, and he tells us that we are his child? Yes, it's God. He is present I have been with you wherever you went. David wasn't the only one needing that reminder. We need that reminder. And so I look at Psalm 113 where it says, The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. You see, the the tendency of mankind on this journey of the ark as we've been studying. The ark is carried along representing the presence of God. But if I leave that ark, then I'm not near the presence of God. And God is saying, no, I am with you wherever you go. 
I have all authority. I am all present. You can cry out to me whenever because I am here all the time. It would have been a very easy thing for Israel to think that they were carrying the ark and the tabernacle tent along their path when the reality was that God had been carrying Israel in the glory of his sovereign grace along his path. We are not the ones taking God on our journey. He has made us a part of his plan, and he is present with us all the time. And in this same fashion, what we've been doing is looking ahead to Jesus, the one who fulfills all of these things perfectly. As a sinner, we are distant from God because that sin creates a barrier. But because of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, when we confess with our mouths and we believe in our heart that he is Lord, then suddenly we have salvation. We have eternal life. We are filled with the very spirit of God. And so his presence is literally in us. So when Jesus says that he's always there, I will be with you wherever you go. In Deuteronomy, where it says, be strong and courageous, do not fear or be in dread for them, of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. We can trust that because God is truth and his word is authority. So who can take God away from what he just stated? Nobody. He is present And so we see this simple rooftop conversation of David and Nathan dreaming about this honorable building they want to build, suddenly interrupted by Almighty God reminding them of these truths in their lives that maybe they had gone astray from. And you might find yourself in that same place this morning. What's distracting you? What's taking your mind off of the truths of God? You're being presented them again this morning from chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, that God is present, that God has the authority But he doesn't stop there. God reminds us that he is also a God to be obeyed. Look at verse 7. And some of you might be struggling with this because you might think that God is kind of giving David this tongue lashing of saying, how dare you think about doing something nice for me? Remember, the tone is not that. But look at verse 7. He asks David a question. Did I speak a word saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Wouldn't this just bring your mindset to a screeching halt if you were David? When God himself, through Nathan, says to you, did I tell you to do that? Do you think I need a house? You may have been thinking lovely things about building me this house, but remember, it's in my authority that this happens. And so God is a God to be obeyed. Once David hears this commentary from God, the word of God, he does obey. So don't get the wrong impression of David in this. He listens to God. But God has to stop him with these reminders that he's worthy. He's the authority. He commands all things because he alone is perfect and righteous and holy. He is to be obeyed. And so the first step in all things is to ask ourselves, are we being led by God? That next word out of your mouth, is it something that honors God and is he telling you to say it or is he telling you to be quiet? Now this might throw some difficulty in how do I do anything if I'm not constantly just in prayer and and evaluating everything. But when we're filled with the Spirit and Scripture tells us to be constantly in prayer, We also have to understand that God has all authority. And so God is bigger than my mistake. If David would have started this building, is God bigger than that? Yes, because God has all the authority and he is sovereign and his plan will be accomplished. But the responsibility falls on us. Is my next step something that I know God wants me to do? Or is it what self wants me to do? And this is where we need to be careful because we just saw two godly spiritual people on a rooftop ready to make a step and it would have been the wrong step. Even though it seemed honorable, even though they were spiritual people. And so I look at that as pastor, as elder, and I think of the meetings that we have and I'm convicted and I say, are we sure that the ideas that we're having, the next steps that we're putting into place, are they led by God and they better be? And you might be saying, yeah, they better be. 
But we need to say that about ourselves too. In all of our decisions, in how we're raising our family, in if I'm taking that job or not, if I'm going to move my family, if I'm going to interact with that person, if I'm going to forgive that person, we can't say that my intentions were good and so that's fine enough. Did God direct our steps? Psalm 25 said, lead me in your truth and teach me. Acts 5.29 says, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And that men includes women and it includes self. Because so often we have an idea and we say, well, that's a great idea because I know the one who came up with that idea. So I'm going to move forward. But it tells us we must obey God rather than men. And we need to put ourselves in that. And then Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. These reminders about how God is the authority and he's present and he needs to be obeyed, these are all great things, but how do we do it? And I'll tell you, it's going to sound like a real easy answer. Prayer. Prayer. How do you communicate with God? How do you give yourself moments of listening to what God is instructing you? It's prayer. Is your heart geared to what God wants you to be thinking about, what he wants you to be pursuing Or are you just kind of walking through life, maybe similar to David, thinking that my intentions are fine, I'm going to build something, and God is saying, you didn't check with me first. That's not what I have planned in my timing, God is saying. And so we have to evaluate personally, what's our prayer life? Are we taking him everything about us? Even what seems like a great, well-intentioned idea, God is to be obeyed. God is present. God is the authority. But he doesn't stop there. Of course not. God is also the source. Notice the intentional focus of the words that I read from God when he says, starting in verse 6, he repeats, I. So he is saying, I, God, and there's this list of things that he says. This proves he's the source of all things, that he's the authority over all things. He says, I commanded, I took you, I have been with you, I will make, I will appoint, I appointed, I will give you rest, I will raise up, I will establish, I will discipline. And I hope that you understand from that that it is God who is the source of all of these things. Anything that is happening, he is very clearly reminding David and Nathan that he is the source. He is responsible. God is in charge. It'd be very easy for both Nathan and David in their positions to think that they were in charge. And this is a constant reminder that we all need because like I said, we want to be in control. We want to be in charge. And so we look for places that we can be in charge. And God is saying, wait, I'm the one who did all of this. He even goes as far as to call out David's past of saying, I'm the one who took you from being a shepherd among the sheep to a king over Israel. Did David do that? No. It's God's plan. It's God's purpose. God is the one who is the source of all these things. And so I want you to see three things within the point of God is the source. The very first one, God creates, initiates, and accomplishes. God is showing David that he doesn't need to accomplish something for God. God is the one who accomplishes his plans. Acts 17 says this, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. We do not do things for God. He allows us to do things that bring him glory and they're part of his plan. David didn't have to create a structure for God. Does God live in temples that man makes? No, he is everywhere. You can't put him in a box. And the authority that he has reminds us that he is the source and he's the one who creates You see, some people see God in this chapter as an egomaniac who's making it all about him. But the reality is this. It is all about him. It is all about God. He's the only one righteous and holy. He is the only one 
who deserves the glory and the honor and the praise, and it is all about him. It's his world. It's his creation. It's his plan. It's his judgment. It's his redemption. It's his son Jesus on the cross, and it's eternity with him. So it is all about him. He's the only one worthy. You see, we need these reminders because mankind naturally wants to make it about ourselves. But then we wouldn't know the truth about salvation because we would think that we could earn it or deserve it or build it. There's something I must be able to do to be worthy, and the answer is nothing. It's only Jesus that makes us worthy. We see within God is the source that he is also a God of grace. And it's God's grace that's responsible for it all. Look at verse 8. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you would be prince over my people, Israel. God is the master of grace. The free gift of salvation is actually free. It's grace. Salvation is what God has done for us, not what we have to do to earn it. It's all grace. You see, Jesus Christ and his work on the cross took us from sinner to saved, as God shows Nathan, from pasture to king, from sinner to saved. That's what Jesus has done for us. From eternal death to eternal life, it's an act of grace, and God is responsible for all of it. Romans 8 actually tells us that we are free because of Jesus. We are alive because of Jesus. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. It's all the work of God. It's not our own efforts. It's not our own accomplishments. It's not how honorable our intentions were that God gives us credit. It's his credit because of Jesus Christ. And it's all because of grace very familiar passage in Ephesians 2 says this, for you have been saved through faith and it's all because of grace. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. If it was left up to us, how much would we paint our accomplishments on the wall? And maybe each Sunday we have a banner with what we've done for God that week and we're hoping that we point it high enough to God that he sees it and he recognizes it and we can suddenly be counted as worthy. And that is not at all how it goes because God is a God of grace and it's a free gift of salvation. You can't earn it. Jesus Christ did all of the work. We don't do any of it. You see, the eagerness to serve God as David was eager to serve God, it's not motivated by mankind recognizing that God needs us to work for him. Our service to God comes from a gratitude of God's grace for us, that as the ultimate king, he chose us, and he gave us redemption through Jesus Christ, and so we serve him eagerly and zealously, David needed this reminder, and so do we. Last week, one of the first questions we asked all the volunteers in training is, who are you serving? I fear that many of us navigate our daily lives and even places of recognition like volunteering, serving ourselves. Because we want to be noticed. We need to do something so that people see us as spiritual or lovely or whatever it may be. And God is saying, but you're not. You do it because of me, because he alone is worthy. And the grace of God should overwhelm us. But we don't see it as grace if we did something to deserve it. And so God makes this message very clear to Nathan to give to David. We saw that God is responsible in all of these I statements, but I want you to briefly look at verses 11 through 16 with me, because we see that God provides blessings. We see in verse 9, I'm not going to read verses 11 through 16, but I'll call out the verses that I want you to look at. Verse 9, we see something amazing that God does for David. And then in turn, because of Jesus Christ, if he is your savior, he does this same thing for you, and that's he gives us identity. Verse 9, David is told, 
that he will have a great name. God promises him. He makes a covenant with him. That's why this particular chapter, chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, is commonly found as one of the greatest chapters in all of Scripture because of the depth of theology here about who God is, but the covenant that he makes with David. And he tells David, I'm going to give you an identity. Not your accomplishments, not your power, your good looks, your strength, your money, none of that. I, God, give you an identity. I'm going to make your name great. And we know that from the very family of David, the line of David, Jesus comes. And if Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you've confessed, you've turned away from your sins, and you accept the free gift of salvation, then you have a great name. You have a brand new identity in Jesus Christ. We see in 1 John 3, it says we should be called the children of God. And so we are. God himself will call you child. What better identity to have than a child of God? And it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone, in, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a brand new identity. God doesn't just stop with one blessing. He pours out a brand new life, a new creation, a new name, a name that will be called out for all of eternity in his presence. That's the God that we're talking about. And so while this covenant with David is critical in this moment, it is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, our Savior. He gives us an identity, but he also gives us a home. Look at verse 10. David is told that he will be planted and God's people will be placed and be disturbed no more. Do you know the relief that that must be to David? After being chased and attempted murders on his life many different times, finally he will have comfort and peace from enemies. What a relief this is, but even greater than that relief is the relief that it is for us to know that we have a home with God someday. If you have Christ as your Savior, then you have that same home for eternity. You see, David is talking about building a house, a structure, something tangible right there. But God is saying, look bigger than that. I will settle this for all of eternity that I am making a place for you to be in my presence forever. God gives us a home. And it's through Jesus Christ who is the son of David. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Are you seeing that God is not just flexing his muscles of authority here? He is the authority. He is the definition of not just authority, but of love and generosity and care and blessings. And we Children of God are the recipients of those blessings. But he doesn't stop at giving us a new name and identity and a new home. He also tells David, and so he's telling us that he gives rest and safety. He says things like, you will be disturbed no more. Violent men shall afflict them no more. And what a beautiful truth for David. But do you understand that the throne of God is established forever? that Jesus has overcome sin and death. And because of him, we have eternal safety and eternal rest in an eternal home with an eternal identity that can't be taken away from anyone because God is the authority. Nobody can take it away. It's not a temporary rooftop afternoon. This is eternal peace and communion with the God of the universe because of Jesus Christ. And so we read in Isaiah 40, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And then Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is there anyone in here this morning that needs rest? Is there anyone in here this morning that needs to trust in their identity, not the identity that's tried to be put on you by the world or friends or family? Is there anyone in here that looks forward to eternally having safe and secure in the presence of God? Yes, all of us. And so I want to close... And yes, we're going to go late. We're going to close by reading David's response 
in the rest of chapter 7. We're not going to study it. I'm simply going to read it. Because David has just been overwhelmed with this truth about the eternal plan of redemption that's going to come from the line of him, David. And he's reminded about the authority, the presence of Almighty God and what's to come and what is right now. And we see now that David responds. And David responds in such a beautiful, worshipful way that I want you to hear it. And I want you to understand the depth of David because last week we talked about worship and what David does in the rest of chapter 7 is he just simply responds to the truth of God. So I'm going to read it. Starting in verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. Because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. For there is no one like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its gods, And you established for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord God, became their God. And now, O Lord, you confirm forever the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house and do as you have spoken. And your name will be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. O Lord God, have... You, O Lord, have spoken, and with your blessing shall this house of your servant be blessed forever. Do you see the truths wrapped into what David is saying? He's acknowledging who God is and what God is going to do, and that it will be accomplished because God alone has the authority. God alone is worthy. You see, his praise is supposed to be flowing from our hearts to our lips in worship. We're to declare the truth about who he is just like David did. And if you look at Revelation chapter 5, you would see that there is this constant proclaiming, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That's the cry that's supposed to come from our lips because of the understanding in our hearts of who God is because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so this final song, we've done it before, and it doesn't fit everyone's style. And it's okay. But the reason that we do this is because it's powerful. You might be familiar with responsive readings, and I'm not going to make you respond to these readings, but in the song format, I ask you to do that. The reason that we do these particular songs is because it's supposed to settle in your spirit what the obvious truth is. And so a lot of times the question itself seems to be very obvious. David asks questions like this. In Psalm 1831, he says, For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? I want you to take this song and internalize the truth and then respond because it is him who gets the praise. Not our comfort level of doing a song a particular way, but declare the power of Almighty God because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. These questions continue in passages like Isaiah 40 where it says this, 
Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? <laughs> 